Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Eamon Viana and Anjali Kidju. Don't ever let them hurt you in any way And never let them steal and take the best of you Keep building cities from the ground We rise and weave the wave Don't ever let them hurt you in any way And never let them steal and take the best of you Keep building cities from the ground We rise and weave the wave Mother Nature has a way of warning us A time bomb set on a lost countdown Do you hear it? Will you stop it? Won't you listen? We need each other now We need each other now Each one of us needs one of us We need each other don't ever let them hurt you in any way oh, never let them steal and take the best of you keep building cities from the ground we rise and weave the wave mother nature Stop it, won't you listen? Ames ya me ne va mi ale bene hi he ya me. Ames ya me ke le gban ya ero la nu silo. I know we are humans, but why can't we use the gift she's giving us? Mother Nature has a way of warning us. A time bomb set on a lost countdown. Do you hear it? Will you stop it? Won't you listen? We need each other now. We need each other now. Each one of us needs one of us. We need each other. Mother Nature has a way of warning us. A time bomb set on a lost countdown. Will you find it? Will you stop it? Won't you listen? <laughs> Thank you, Angelic and Amen, for this uh, musical opening of the meeting. Your Royal Highnesses, 
Excellencies, distinguished heads of state and government, Excellencies, dear partners and friends of the World Economic Forum, a very cordial welcome to the 2023 annual meeting. We are coming together under the motto, Cooperation in a Fragmented World. At the beginning of this year, we are confronted with unprecedented and multiple challenges. First, our global economy is undergoing deep transformation. The energy transition, the consequences of COVID, the reshaping of supply chains are all serving as catalytic forces for the economic transformation. And the hotspots of this geo-economic remodeling are high inflation, increasing interest rates, and growing national debt. This is particularly hurting low- and middle-income groups. It is exacerbating societal fragmentation. Second, the geopolitical system is also undergoing deep systemic transformation. Internationally, we are moving to what some people would call a messy patchwork of powers. There are superpowers, emerging powers, middle powers, regional powers, rogue states, and also large corporate and social media powers, all competing increasingly for power and influence. As a result, the trend is again moving towards increased fragmentation and confrontation. Thirdly, our generation has reached a turning point confronted by truly existential problems climate change, exploitation of nature, nuclear possible incidents, or even worse, extreme poverty and viruses. They all can lead to an extinction of large parts of our global population. And we have seen how much dealing with those risks, such as COVID or global warming, have again fragmented populations. And finally, the fourth industrial revolution offers us tremendous opportunities. But at the same time, technologies as computing, quantum computing, blockchain, genetics, and so on, they also could create deep societal fragmentation. We have the ability to collaboratively build a more peaceful, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable world. But to do so, we need to overcome the most critical fragmentation. And the most critical fragmentation is between those who take a constructive attitude and those who are just bystanders, observers, and even go into the negative, critical, and confrontational attitude. But the spirit of Davos is positive, is constructive. It means investing into a greener and therefore more sustainable economy, investing into a more cohesive society, by providing everyone with the appropriate skills and opportunities, investing into the hard and soft infrastructure that modern societies require. And here in Davos, it means despite all those challenges, it means particularly investing in the spirit and the practice of solving problems through mutual respect and cooperation. 
We believe that we can do it, that through collective responsibility, innovation, human goodwill, and ingenuity, we have the capacity to turn the challenges into opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, I have now the great pleasure and honor to introduce Alain Berset, President of the Swiss Confederation and Federal Counselor for the Federal Department of Internal Affairs. The World Economic Forum has been based in Switzerland for 53 years, and it is over this period the cooperation between the Swiss federal government, the canton of Graubünden, and the municipality of Davos has been, the partnership has been truly exceptional. I would like uh, to express, Mr. President, and all our Swiss hosts, our sincere gratitude for the hospitality and support all over those years. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the, Confederation, to the President of the Swiss Confederation, Alain Berset. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Schwab, the post-war order is currently experiencing uh, its greatest crisis. Russia's war of aggression of, on Ukraine constitutes a brutal attack on a peaceful country. But it is also a brutal attack on international law and multilateralism. The war is causing great suffering and it is playing a decisive role on the global development of democracy. That is why the great solidarity shown by democratic countries with Ukraine is crucial. Solidarity with the people in the country, but also with those who have fled. And this aggression has come of all countries, from a member of the UN Security Council, which, and I quote from the UN Charter, bears primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. And in spite of this, or no, precisely because of this, Switzerland will make every effort to again strengthen international law and multilateralism. In the UN Security Council for the first time this year and through international Geneva, the seat of one of the most important multilateral platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, the world needs strong multilateral platforms because the greatest present-day challenges are transnational. Climate change, pandemic, war, migration, proliferation. And this annual meeting is also an important platform for global dialogue. It is a place of optimism, of can-do spirits, and this is especially so in times of crisis. When I first attended the annual meeting back in 2012, the motto was the great transformation shaping new models. And it was a call to look to the future with optimism and to have confidence in the strength of our shared values and vision. But even at that time, even at the time, WEF founder Klaus Schwab warned that inclusion is critical at a time when the number one risk to the world is rising inequality. 
And this warning has proven to be as accurate as it was far-sighted. For since then, inequality worldwide has continued to grow. The World Inequality Report 2022, which measures global wealth, income, gender, and ecological inequality, comes to the conclusion that inequality today is as great as it was 20 years ago. And all the fears expressed at the 2012 annual meeting have come true. Inequality brings with it huge political and social collateral damage. And what we call populism is essentially a reaction to growing inequality. We all know that extreme inequality undermines social cohesion. It creates resentment, causing us to seek scapegoats. And it is politically toxic, eating away at our faith in democracy. The number of democracies worldwide has diminished very much. According to Freedom House, around 50%, 50% of the world's population lived in democracies 10 years ago. And today, that figure is just 20%. And we find ourselves at a tipping point. Democratic institutions are being weakened. In certain places, the rule of law is under threat, even in some democratically constituted states. And the rule of law is also at risk of eroding in the international system. Business as usual is no longer an option. We must take steps to defend steadfastly the foundations that are a condition for civilized coexistence. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have given much thought, also here at the annual meeting, to efficiency and prosperity, but too little to social fairness. What applies in the domestic politics of most countries also applies in relations between states. And here, too, inequality is growing at an alarming rate, and already fragile states are further weakened. First, by climate change and the pandemic, and then by the war in Ukraine. Around 350 million people in 82 countries are currently at acute risk of hunger, according to the UN World Food Programme. That's 200 million more than before the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. In large parts of Africa, the consequences are dramatic. Before the war, 90% of grain supplied to Eritrea and Somalia came from Russia and Ukraine. And the sharp rises in the price of fertilizer and oil have a huge impact on the continent's poorest countries, weakening them further still. The COVID pandemic also hit already fragile, fragile states hardest. Inequality increased significantly. And what is particularly difficult to accept is that prior to 2020, African countries were among the fastest growing in the world. Yes, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many countries in Africa, just as many parts of the world, have been weakened by this terrible war and seen their ambition reduced. But that does not diminish the importance of these countries. It does, however, require a rethink. It needs an active global partnership, a partnership that recognizes the enormous potential of countries in Africa and strengthens human rights and democracy a partnership that addresses humanitarian needs as well as supports economic opportunities and innovation. Inequalities are not eliminated by charity. Take the example of COVID-19 vaccines. Promises were made to help fragile countries, Switzerland too, 
lent its financial and political support to the COVAX initiative of the World Health Organization, which wanted to achieve equitable uh, access to vaccines worldwide. But when it came to distributing vaccines, there was little evidence of that kind of partnership. In light of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, we have seen that the risk of fragility is no longer a one-way street. The problems experienced by fragile states do not remain within their own borders. They are always exported to neighboring countries, but also to far-flung regions in the form of migration, corruption, terrorism. And we must do all we can to support fragile states, otherwise they risk becoming failed states. And that is why Switzerland will work systematically on behalf of the most vulnerable, in particular to protect the civilian population and improve food security. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, frag fragility poses a threat to all of us. That is true domestically but it is also true internationally. Self-interest and supporting those weaker than ourselves. We have long considered these to be two different things, but now we know they are one and they are the same. Thank you very much. Madam Zelenska, First Lady of Ukraine, it's a great honor to have you at our annual meeting in Davos. Thank you for coming. We know it has been a difficult journey. It's been almost a year since Russia invaded your country, sparking a war that has cost far too many Ukrainian lives. Tens of thousands, many of them civilians, many of them children. The largest refugee crisis in the 21st century and millions internally displaced. Amid this profound crisis, Ukrainians have stood strong in common cause galvanized by the leadership of President Zelensky and yourself, Madam First Lady. It has inspired many around the world and in this room. Madam Zelenska, since the beginning of the war, you have been an ambassador and advocate for your country and its people. You have been a powerful voice in global capitals and have worked tirelessly to address the human impact of the war. Helping people access health care, mental care, education, and other resources they need during this difficult time. Your leadership is ensuring Ukraine and Ukrainians are stronger today and are on a path for even a stronger tomorrow. We are very eager to hear from you on what lies ahead. Madam Zelenska, 
the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Put on your phones. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, the representatives of the world who are here today in Europe, in Switzerland, in Davos. Please take a look at this hall and see the number and the kind of people here. The number and the kind of the people who will be taking part in the events of this forum. Heads of states, chiefs of international organizations, business leaders, prominent economists, public figures, journalists and scientists. People have influence for entire industries, for nations and for the world as a whole. You're all united by the fact that you are really very influential. But there is also something that separates you, and that is that not all of you are using this influence, or well, sometimes you use it in a way that divides even more. A meeting such as the Davos Forum exists because deep inside we all believe that there is no global problem that the humanity, that the mankind would not be able to resolve. We have enough energy and strength for it. The sum of our um, combined influence is bigger than the weight of existing challenges. But for there to be a sum, we need to, um, to add its components, its parts, and that's global cooperation. And it is all the more important right now when Russia's aggression in Europe makes various challenges facing the world and wraps them into one large-scale crisis. The, we are facing a threat of a collapse of the world as we know it, the, the, the way that we are accustomed to it, or to, to what we aspire. What can be life in a world where tanks are allowed to, to strike at nuclear power stations? What will happen to inflation when state borders start to collapse and the integrity of countries will be trampled on by those who want it? What will happen to the cost of living when millions, not millions, but tens of millions of people will be forced to flee a mass starvation and will become refugees? How does the world want to achieve climate neutrality if so far it hasn't even started? stop the burning of entire cities in Ukraine. This is what Russia is doing with its artillery, with its missiles, with its Iranian drones. And you know that the Russian aggression was never intended to restrict itself to the Ukrainian borders. This war can go further and it, it make uh, crises wider if the aggressor does not lose. In other words, if the sum of our influence does not outweigh the aggression. Ladies and gentlemen, my husband, the president of Ukraine, when he addressed the leaders of 19 states who are economically the most powerful, offered them of, un, unto the whole world a formula about how we can become the most powerful in peacekeeping. It's a 10-point plan. It's 10 points about how we outweigh the Russian aggression and how we prevent existing regional and global crises from converging into one full-scale, uh, full-on global crisis. I want to emphasize that these points are not purely political. Each one of them has a tangible human dimension. This is the dimension of parents who are crying in an ICU where doctors are trying to, to fight for the life of their wounded child. Or a boy whose family was shot by the occupiers as they were trying to evacuate. 
This is the dimension of farmers who are afraid to go back to their fields because the mines have been scattered uh, all over these fields by the occupiers. This is the dimension of people who have lost their homes and are forced to seek shelter wherever they can be accepted. I ask you to look at the need uh, to stop this aggression exactly like this, with the eyes of the people whose lives have been um, brought into chaos by the um, uh, aggressive country. When we talk about the peace formula, when, when we talk about radiation and nuclear safety, what we mean is that we cannot allow a new Chernobyl to happen. We do not want children somewhere in the world to be forced to learn how to protect themselves from radiation disease. When in the peace formula we talk about food security, what we mean is that there's a right to food that every human being has, and it's an insult for mankind and for human nature itself that in the 21st century it is possible for us to have mass uh, starvation. Uh, simply because uh, because there is a targeted aggression because of, uh, of some country. When we talk about energy security, we mean that no child in the world should have to do their homework by candlelight, like children in Ukraine are doing, that no doctor would have to perform surgeries in the light of flashlights, as recently in Kyiv and Lviv. For me, the most painful point of the formula is the release of all the prisoners and deportees. These thousands upon thousands of Ukrainians who have been deported to Russia and who are being lied to, that no one is going to help them. They are not the only ones being tortured. Their families are also tortured by uncertainty. These are also thousands of children that we must protect from the dissolution of their bond with their motherland, which is exactly what Russia is doing when, they, uh, when it puts up thousands of Ukrainian children uh, by, uh, for adoption by Russian families. And this is not just an attempt by Russia to wipe the memory of these children about who they are. It's a crime against the very sense of parenthood, against that primeval bond between the mother and a child and father and child. Everyone has a right to life. So a separate point of the peace formula is the withdrawal of Russian troops from the entire sovereign territory of Ukraine. And thus, uh, guaranteed cessation of hostilities and terror by the occupiers against Ukrainians. This will restore the force of international law and the UN Charter. Purely from the human point of view, in these occupied territories, these are our people in these territories who have been torn apart from their families and they're waiting for liberation. And while they're waiting, millions of people are experiencing the fear uh, uh, and the Russian repression. Another point of the formula is justice. This is what the dignity of each person that died under the rubble of its, his or her own home demands of us. It's what uh, uh, children and adults have lost their limbs because of Russian strike, strikes demand of us. Everyone who was trying to survive in the basement of Mariupol while Russian shells and bombs were evaporating their city, everyone who was yearning for salvation in Bucha, hiding from Russian executioners. Justice is needed so that no one in the world would ever think that war crimes and genocidal policies can go unpunished. It's not what the living and the dead Ukrainians need. It's needed by the world because no one should think that this violence can be repeated again. The peace formula returns security not only to people. If you've seen the scorched earth from the Russian strikes, the burnt forests, the closed off areas because of the thousands of mines, we can see what kind of a traumatized environment we can leave to the next generations. And I constantly try to convey that in Ukraine there is no place which is completely safe. And unfortunately, also, you can't take a day off from war. Everyone who is now in Ukraine has to risk his or her life every day. There is nothing off limits for Russia. As we speak, 
in our city of Dnipro. People are still working on, and working uh, and sorting through the debris of a residential area of a, a house that was destroyed by an anti-ship missile. This missile was built to destroy aircraft carriers and was used against the civilian infrastructure. This morning we heard about 43 casualties. When we, since we started this forum, uh, it, it grew to 43 casualties. These were people, ordinary people, at home on a Saturday, and that's enough reason for Russia to kill. And that's why the ninth point of our formula is about guaranteed non-escalation. And of course, at some point we have to pronounce an end to this war, not only so we have a date, so that we can reset the time and start counting peace time, because peace does not equal a truce. It's so that our people can return home, who are scattered around the world right now, so that our fathers, our mothers, sons and daughters can return from the front line, for families to reunite, the families that were torn apart by the war. Ladies and gentlemen, unity is what brings peace back. And today I would like to hand over to my colleagues, my, my counterparts um, of the forum, uh, letters from the President of Ukraine to Mr. Alan Verse, the President of the Swiss Confederation, to Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, and also a letter addressed to, to Mr. Xi Jinping, the head of the uh, People's Republic of China, I hand it over to Mr. Liu He, the, the Vice Premier of the State Council of China. There's an old saying, if people come together, they can move even Mount Taishan. Uh, and we believe that the world will unite for peace. Ukraine has already received answers, some positive answers from many of uh, heads of states about their readiness to work together on the um, peace formula. This year may not become the year of the poly crisis that we hear about if it becomes a year of the Ukrainian peace formula, which will come true. Thank you. Glory to Ukraine. Dear Madam President, von der Leyen, liebe Ursula, at a time in history, as we have seen also in the speech of the First Lady, in a time, at a time in history during which unprecedented, unimaginable challenges demand exceptional leaders, it is a deep honor to have you with us to present your vision for the future of Europe and Europe's role in the world. I'm convinced that your commitment and your visionary leadership to a stronger and closer union, particularly during those times where Europe is really tested have been so essential your leadership and will continue to be so. Madam President, we are excited to have us with you today. The stage is yours.
Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, lieber Klaus, my dearest Orlena, for almost one year now, Ukraine has stunned the world. On that fateful February morning, many predicted that Kyiv would fall in a matter of days. But this did not account for the morale and the physical courage of Ukrainian people. Dearest Olena, you and your people, you have resisted the Russian invasion and pushed back against the aggressor, against all odds. Not even Russia's relentless attacks on civilians, and you have described them, or the specter of a brutal winter have shaken your resolve. In this last year, your country has moved the world and has inspired Europe. And I can assure you that Europe will always stand with you. Many doubt it whether that European support would be so unwavering. But today, Ukraine is a candidate country to access the European Union. European European countries are providing more and more critical weapons to Ukraine. We're hosting around 4 million Ukrainians in our cities, our homes and our schools. And we have put in place the strongest sanctions ever, which leave the Russian economy facing a decade of regression and its industry starved of any modern and critical technologies. There will be no impunity for these Russian crimes. And my friends, there will be no let up in our steadfast support to Ukraine, from helping to restore power, heating and water, to preparing for the long-term effort of reconstruction. And to reaffirm that support, we announced yesterday that the Commission is delivering 3 billion euros of financial support. This is the first tranche of our 18 billion support package for 2023, the largest ever macrofinancial assistance to a third country. This is a strong message, and this will bolster Ukraine's financial stability, help to pay wages, ensure the running of hospitals, and housing services and schools. I just want to say, my dearest Olena, and I think I can speak on behalf of this hall and this audience here, we are in it for as long as it takes and stand by our Ukrainian friends. And Europe's reaction to the war is the latest example in how our union has pulled together when it matters the most. Take energy. A year ago, Europe had a massive dependency on Russian fossil fuels built over decades. This made us vulnerable to supply squeezes, price hikes, and of course vulnerable to Putin's market manipulation. In less than a year, Europe has overcome this dangerous dependency. We have replaced 80% of Russian pipeline gas. In parallel, we have filled our storages. Of course, we have reduced our demand by more than 20% in the period from August to November. And through collective effort, we brought down gas prices quicker than anyone expected. From its peak in August, this was 350 euros per megawatt hour. It is now European natural gas prices down, dropped by 80% by this month. That is below the levels of before the Ukraine war. Europe has once again shown the power of its collective will. Nevertheless, we should be under no illusion how difficult these periods, first of pandemic and then followed by a war, 
are for our families and for our businesses. And we will have to show the same resolve as we face up to a collision of crises. Dear Klaus, as your global risk report sets it out, we see rising inflation making the cost of living and the cost of doing business more expensive. We see energy being used as a weapon. We see threats of trade wars and the return of confrontational geopolitics. In addition, climate change already comes with a huge cost. And we have no time to lose in the transition to a clean economy. And that's what I want to speak about. The net zero transformation is already causing huge industrial, economic, and geopolitical shifts, by far the quickest and the most pronounced in our lifetime. It is changing the nature of work. It is reshaping the nature of our industry. But we are on the brink of something far greater. Just think, in less than three decades, we want to reach net zero. In less than three decades, we have to reach net zero. But the road to net zero means developing and using a whole range of new clean technologies across our economy, in transport, in buildings, in manufacturing, in energy. The next decades will see the greatest industrial transformation of our times, maybe of any times. And those who develop and manufacture the technology that will be the foundation of tomorrow's economy will have the greatest competitive edge. So the scale of the opportunity is clear for all to see. The International Energy Agency estimates that the market for mass manufactured clean energy tech will be worth around $650 billion a year by 2030, more than triple today's levels. To get ahead of the competition, we need to keep investing in strengthening our industrial base and making Europe more investment and innovation friendly. And that is what investors are looking closely at in the different markets for clean tech. Here in Europe, we moved first with the European Green Deal to set the path to climate neutrality by 2050. We have cast our net zero target into law to provide the predictability and the transparency business needs. We followed up with our investment firepower of next generation EU, that is our 800 billion investment plan, the Just Transition Fund and other instruments across the economy. This is unprecedented investment in clean technology across all sectors of the green transition. Clean tech is now the fastest growing investment sector in Europe, doubling its value between 2020 and 2021 alone. And the good news for the planet is that other major economies are also now stepping up. Japan's green, trans green transformation plan aims to help raise up to 20 trillion yen around 140 billion euros through green transition bonds. India has put forward a production-linked incentive scheme to enhance their competitiveness in sectors like solar photovoltaics and batteries. The United Kingdom, Canada, and many others have also put forward their investment plans in clean tech. And of course, we have seen the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, that 369 billion US dollars clean tech investment plan. That means that together, the European and the United States alone are putting forward almost a trillion euros 
to accelerate the clean energy economy. This has the potential to massively boost the path to climate neutrality. But it is no secret that certain elements of the design of the Inflation Reduction Act raised a number of concerns in terms of some of the targeted incentives for companies. So this is why we have been working with our United States friends to find solutions, for example, so that EU companies and EU-made electric cars can also benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Our aim should be to avoid disruptions in transatlantic trade and investment. We should ensure that our respective incentive programs are fair and mutually reinforcing. And we should also set out how we can jointly benefit from this massive investment, for example, by creating economies of scale across the Atlantic or setting common standards. At the heart of the joint vision is our conviction that competition and trade are the key to speeding up clean tech and climate neutrality. And that means that we Europeans also need to get better at nurturing our own clean tech industry. We know that we have a small window to invest in clean energy and innovation and clean tech before the fossil fuel economy becomes obsolete. So we have an industry at the moment being challenged by the pandemic, supply chain issues and price shocks. We see aggressive attempts to attract our industrial capacities away to China and elsewhere. We have a compelling need to make this net zero transition without creating new dependency. We've learned our lessons from the fossil fuels. And we know that future investment decisions will be taken now, depending on what we do today. We Europeans have a plan, a Green Deal industrial plan. Our plan to make Europe the home of clean tech and industrial innovation on the road to net zero. Our Green Deal industrial plan will be covering four different pillars. The regulatory environment, financing, skills and trade. The first pillar is about speed and access. We need to create a regulatory environment that allows us to scale up fast and to create conducive conditions for sectors crucial to reach the net zero goal that we've set ourselves. This includes, for example, wind, heat pumps, solar, clean hydrogen, storage and other topics for which demand is boosted by our next generation EU and Repower EU investments. To help make this happen, we will put forward a new Net Zero Industry Act. This will follow the same model as our CHIPS Act. The new Net Zero Industry Act will identify clear goals for European clean tech by 2030, the aim will be to focus investment on strategic projects along the entire supply chain. We will especially look at how to simplify and fast track the permitting process for clean tech production sites. In parallel to this Net Zero Industry Act, we will reflect on how to make important projects of common European interest, the famous IPCEIs, faster to process, easier to fund, simpler to access for small and medium um, enterprises and for all our member states. The Net Zero Industry Act will go hand in hand with the Critical Raw Materials Act. For rare earth, 
which are vital for manufacturing key technologies like wind power generation, hydrogen storage, you name it. Europe is today 98% dependent on one country, China. Or take lithium, with just three countries accounting for more than 90% of the lithium production, the entire supply chain has become incredibly tight. This has pushed up prices and is threatening our competitiveness, so we need to improve the refining, processing and recycling of raw materials here in Europe. And in parallel, we will work with our trade partners to cooperate on sourcing, production and processing to overcome the existing monopoly. To do this, we can build a critical raw materials club working with like-minded partners from the United States to Ukraine to collectively strengthen supply chains and to diversify away from single monopoly. This is pillar one, speed and access through the Net Zero Industry Act. The second pillar of the Green Deal Industrial Plan will boost investment and financing of clean tech production. To keep European industry attractive, there is a need to be competitive with offers and incentives that are currently available outside the European Union. This is why we will propose to temporarily adapt our state aid rules to speed up and simplify them. Easier calculations, simpler procedures, accelerated approvals. For example, simple tax break models. And with targeted aid for production facilities and strategic clean tech value chains to counter relocation risks from foreign subsidies. But we also know that state aid will only be a limited solution which only a few member states can use. Now to avoid fragmenting of the single market and to support the clean tech transition across the whole union, we must also step up EU funding. For the medium term, we will prepare a European Sovereignty Fund as part of the midterm review of our budget this year. This will provide a structural solution to boost the resources available for upstream research, innovation and strategic industrial projects. But as this will take time, we will look at a bridging solution where it is most needed to provide fast and target, targeted support. And to support this, we are currently working hard on a needs assessment. So the second pillar is funding and state aid. The third pillar of the Green Deal Industrial Plan will be developing the needed skills to make this transition happen. The best technology is only as good as the skilled workers who can install and operate it. And with a huge growth in new technologies, we will need a huge growth in skills and skilled workers in this sector. This will cut across all we do, whether it is regulation or finance, and will be the priority of our European Year of Skills. The fourth pillar will be to facilitate open and fair trade to the benefit of all. For clean tech to deliver net zero globally, there will be a need for strong and resilient supply chains. Our economies will rely ever more on international trade as the transition speeds up to open more markets and to access the input needed for the industry. So we need an ambitious trade agenda, including by making the most, for example, out of the existing trade agreements, for example, with Canada or, for example, with the United Kingdom, with which we are trying hard to sort out our difficulties. We're working on concluding agreements with Mexico, Chile, 
New Zealand and Australia, and to make progress with India and Indonesia. And we need to restart a conversation regarding the Mercosur Agreement. Because international trade is key to helping our industry cut costs, create jobs, and develop new products. But by the same token, where trade is not fair, we must respond more robustly. China has made boosting clean tech innovation and manufacturing a key priority of its five-year plan. That's good. It dominates global production in sectors like electric vehicles and solar panels, which are essential for the transition. But competition on net zero must be based on a level playing field. China has been openly encouraging energy intensive companies in Europe and elsewhere to relocate all or part of their production. They do so with the promise of cheap energy, low labor costs and a more lenient regulatory environment. At the same time, China heavily subsidizes its industry and restricts access to its market for European Union companies. We still need to work and trade with China, especially when it comes to this transition. So we need to refocus our approach on de-risking rather than decoupling this means using all our tools to deal with unfair practices, including the new foreign subsidies regulation. And we will not hesitate to open investigations if we consider that our procurement or other markets are being distorted by such subsidies. We want to cooperate. We want to work together. Climate change needs a global approach, but it has to be a fair approach and a level playing field. Ladies and gentlemen, the story of the clean tech economy is still being written. And over the years I've been coming to Davos, I've heard many times that we are on the cusp of a period of creative destruction that the economist Josef Schumpeter spoke of. His idea that innovation and new tech replaces the old, leaving the old industry and jobs behind. In many ways, this dynamic applies to the clean tech revolution of today and tomorrow. But I believe if Europe gets it right, the story of in many ways, this dynamic applies to the clean tech revolution of today and tomorrow. But I believe if Europe gets it right, the story of clean tech economy can be one of creative construction with the right support and incentives for companies to innovate, with the right focus on skills and people, with the right environment. In many ways, this dynamic applies to the clean tech revolution of today and tomorrow. But I believe And uh, now, of course, it may, be, it may sound premature, but we have to prepare ourselves. Could you say some words? About absolutely, this? absolutely. It is not premature. It is up and running since this month. We started the, the reconstruction platform because it includes repair and relief right now. And Ukraine needs repair and relief right now. 
then to go slowly but surely into the reconstruction. And indeed, the political leadership is uh, with G7, the motor, the engine, is with the Secretariat, with the European Commission in Brussels and in Kyiv together with our Ukrainian friends. And it is of utmost importance that on one hand, globally we raise the necessary investment for reconstruction, but that on the other hand, at the same time, we do the necessary reforms to move forward. Ukraine wants to become a member of the European Union. And it is a perfect opportunity to take investment and reform to pave this way for Ukraine towards the European Union. And my call on you is, we need every helping hand on board. Ukraine de deserves to have as much support as possible. And what we need is not only investment with the public sector, but the private investment and your knowledge you know so much in your respective fields. So we need your knowledge, we need, need every hand on board to really move forward with repair, relief at the very beginning, but also reconstruction. The people of Ukraine really deserve it. Ursula, you have laid out um, the revitalization efforts for Europe. I would like to uh, come back with maybe the last question to the role Europe is playing uh, globally and um, in terms of, I mean, the geopolitical leadership, uh, security and values. You have uh, touched upon some of those points. But I know um, in addition to all your, your different initiatives, there is the Global Gateway Initiative. Um, I think since it uh, concerns many of the partners of Europe, yeah. maybe you would like to say something about it. Global Gateway is our 300 billion investment plan for infrastructure abroad for the next five years. There's a huge need for investment in infrastructure and we want to be the offer as a partner where there is the investment in the infrastructure, coupled with the added value that stays locally, transparency, and reliability and predictability. And I give you some examples uh, what the Global Gateway investment in, is in, for example. Um, I've spoken about the enormous dependency of the European Union of Russian fossil fuels before Russia unleashed the war against Ukraine. Um, the European Union was the biggest client for pipeline gas worldwide, and Russia was the biggest supplier worldwide. And this huge demand of the European Union is now completely shifted away from Russia. We have completely decoupled and diversified away. But this demand, of course, is looking for new, trusted, long-term suppliers. And we have to be very careful that we do not create a lock-in effect in fossil fuels, but that we use this opportunity to leapfrog forward into clean energy. And here comes the opportunity of Global Gateway. Our friends, for example, on the African continent have resources for renewable energy in abundance. What is missing is the infrastructure. And therefore, there we have a common interest that Global Gateway is investing in infrastructure for green hydrogen, for example, solar panel, wind, but also other possibilities so that this infrastructure is being built up with a common interest on both sides that we want the added value fairly placed and predictable. Another example is um, the topic of vaccines. We learned our lesson in the pandemic that it is not sustainable if vaccines have to be donated. The African continent, our African friends, want the technology, rightly so. 
and therefore the mRNA technology has been brought to different countries, there with private partners, Global Gateway is building up together with our African friends manufacturing capacities for vaccines in order to give the opportunity and have the next time that we have the need for vaccines, the technology on the African country, uh, continent, vaccines, vaccines manufactured in Africa for Africa, and all the possibilities that are in this new revolutionary mRNA technology. Two very recent examples that show what Global Gateway is all about. Madam President, I, in, in the beginning, and uh, I just said we want to have here at this meeting a let's do it attitude, and uh, we have the capabilities. Uh, I think you, your um, speech this morning um, provided the best example of the le let's do forward-looking attitude and we have to be also clear that we have to do the necessary investments. But I just want to highlight one point, the necessary investments into the skills which we need in the future. So we wish you all a very good, how should I say, progress in all those visionary initiatives. And thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated for the upcoming session. Ladies It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce His Excellency Lee Herb, Vice Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China. In the past three years, the world has been undergoing tremendous changes with many challenges, the pandemic, the war in Europe, the slowing economy, the energy crisis, food crisis, supply chain instability, climate change, 
and I could go on. The world is becoming even more fragmented, and we must seek cooperation in this fragmented world. Since China started its opening up and reform process over 40 years ago, the country has made great contributions to the development of the global economy. Yet, the world is in transformation, and we are all focused to rethink our development models. The global community, Your Excellency, is eager to understand the next chapter of China's development strategy, both domestically and globally, particularly after the Communist Party's 20th Congress. And we would like to know the opportunities in China and how we can work together with China to tackle the collective challenges that the world is facing. Cooperation instead of fragmentation. As director of the Office of the Central Commission for Finance and Economy, director of the Financial Stability and Development Committee of the State Council, head of the leading group for national science and technology system reform and innovation systems development, Vice Premier Liu has played a key role and key roles in China's economy, financial and technolo technology sector, as well as China's international cooperation for, the, for over 30 years now. He is a recognized leader and a well-known person internationally. Today, we all need to work together to make progress in this fragmented world. We firmly believe that China will play and can play an important role, so we are all keen to hear your perspectives. Mr. Vice-Premier, of China, assume how much will China assume a responsive and responsible role to avoid further fragmentation in the world? Please welcome Vice Premier Liu He. Dr. Klaus Schwab, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good morning. Let me begin by thanking Dr. Schwab for inviting me to Davos again. The last time I came here was 2018. Over the past five years, we have experienced all kinds of unexpected events and witnessed profound changes in the world's political and economic landscape. Therefore, the theme of this year's annual meeting, Cooperation in a Fragmented World, cannot be more relevant. Mutual understanding is an important prerequisite for cooperation. We've been conducting online communications recently, but we realized 
that no matter how technologically advanced it is, is no substitute for in-person meetings. I had quite a number of very warm meetings with some old friends these two days. At this face-to-face -face event, I hope I can help you understand the Chinese economy better. In 2022, China completed its major political agenda. We held the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China and elected the new central leadership with President Xi Jinping at its core. We drew up an ambitious blueprint for advancing Chinese modernization in the coming five years and beyond. Last month, we held the annual Central Economic Work Conference to make plans for this year in line with the development of the 20th CPC National Congress. Last year, China's growth was 3 percent, and we managed to keep jobs and prices stable. Urban surveyed unemployment rate was 5.6 percent, CPI was 2 percent, and the current account surplus was slightly above 2 percent of GDP. In 2023, we will continue to work to make progress while maintaining stability and follow a proactive fiscal policy and a prudent monetary policy. We will strive to maintain reasonable economic growth and keep prices and jobs stable. Our focus will be placed on expanding domestic demand, keeping industrial and supply chains smooth, supporting the healthy development of private sector, deepening state-owned enterprises reform, attracting foreign investment, and preventing and diffusing economic and financial risks. If we work hard enough, we are confident that in 2023, China's growth will most likely return to its normal trend and the Chinese economy will see a significant improvement. A noticeable increase of import, more investment by companies, and residential consumption returning back to normal can be expected. Over the past 10 years, China's GDP grew from 54 trillion to 121 trillion yuan. Average life expectancy rose from 74.8 to 78.2 years last year. And contribution to the global growth last year reached around 36%. There are at least five things that we always bear in mind in making such achievements. First, we must always take economic development as the primary and central task. Under the new circumstances, guided by the philosophy of innovative, coordinated, green, open and shared development, High-quality economic development must always be our goal. 
Second, we must always make establishing a socialist market economy the direction of our reform. We must let the market play a fundamental role in resource allocation and let the government play a better role. Some people say that China will go for the planned economy. That is by no means possible. We will stay committed to deepening SOE reform, support the private sector and their growth, promote fair competition, oppose monopoly and champion entrepreneurship. Third, we must always promote all-round opening up. Opening up as a basic state policy is a catalyst of reform and development in China and a key driver of economic progress. China's door to the outside world will only open wider. Fourth, we must always uphold the rule of law. We must protect property rights and IPRs in accordance with the law. We must create a world-class and market-oriented business environment underpinned by a sound legal framework. Both government and market activities must stay within the confines of law. Fifth, we must pursue innovation-driven development. We should promote innovation and education, grow human capital, foster a sound interaction of finance, technology and industry, and work to boost productivity. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the above five points are the important experience we have learned and gained since China started its reform and opening up. We must stick to them and never waver in our commitment. Let me also briefly touch upon three issues about the Chinese economy. First, where we are in resolving financial risks, those in the real estate sector in particular. Second, our thinking on the dual circulation. Third, the rationale behind China's goal of common prosperity. The financial risks that emerged in China over the past five years are a result of multiple factors, including macroeconomic downturn, loose financial supervision, imprudent business expansion, and insider control. We fought a tough battle to address these risks. We dealt with conglomerates as well as small and medium-sized financial institutions of high risks, disposed of distressed assets, curbed shadow banking activities, and handled unusual volatility in the capital market. Thanks to these efforts, we have managed to maintain overall financial stability and prevented systemic risks. We are drafting the financial stability law right now, which is expected to provide legal safeguards for diffusing risks and maintaining financial stability as we go forward. The real estate sector is still a pillar for China's economy. But there have been changes since 2021. The real estate sector accounts for nearly 40% of bank lending, around 50% of overall local government fiscal resources, and 60% of urban household assets. 
Therefore, we pay much attention to the changes that have taken place, including a rapid decline in property prices and home sales. Many property developers suffered from liquidity shortage and deteriorating balance sheet. The risks of a handful of leading property developers are particularly noticeable. If not handled properly, risks, risks in the housing sector are likely to trigger systemic risks. That is why prompt steps must be taken to address them. That said, while doing so, we should also prevent possible moral hazards. Here is what we have done. First, we have stabilized expectations by honoring contracts and protecting property rights. For the 2,600-plus pre-sold but unfinished housing projects that concern 1.88 million people across the country, we have made ensuring their delivery a priority, and this helped prevent panic in the market. Second, we have conducted massive blood transfusion to the real estate sector. The liquidity situation of real estate companies has been greatly enhanced by way of fresh bank lending, bond issuance guarantee, and equity financing. Third, we have relaxed restrictions that were once introduced to addressing the overheating in the property market, to effectively expand demand and enable property developers to generate revenue. Thanks to these efforts, the property market in China has seen noticeable improvement. Looking ahead, China's urbanization is still on a fast track, and the enormous potential demand generated in this process will provide a strong underpinning for the development of the real estate sector. Right now, China is stepping up efforts to foster a new development paradigm with domestic circulation as the mainstay and domestic and international circulations reinforcing each other. The focus of domestic circulation is on expanding internal demand, promoting industrial upgrade, developing a consumption-led growth model, and rebalancing the economy. This is a logic reflecting international consensus since the financial crisis in 2008. China needs to rebalance, so does the United States. The world economy needs a rebalancing. However, for domestic circulation to function well, it must rely on international division of labor and cooperation as well as more foreign trade and investment. Therefore, the new development paradigm of dual circulation is to be pursued in open economy. China's national reality dictates that opening up to the world is a must, not an expediency. We must open up wider and make it work better. We oppose unilateralism and protectionism and look forward to strengthening comprehensive international cooperation with all countries for world economic stability and development and the promotion of economic re-globalization. Now that China has completed the mission of building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we have come up with a new social development goal of achieving common prosperity, a historic mission that will help us ensure lasting stability. It is a long-term task that requires an incremental and gradual approach. It is not something to be achieved overnight. Common prosperity, as we see it, is aimed at preventing polarization. 
It can only be attained through common development and the hard work of every Chinese. Common prosperity is by no means a synonym of egalitarianism or welfareism. As China grows, all Chinese people will be better off. But that doesn't mean their incomes and level of prosperity have to be the same. That is to say, there will be equal opportunities, but no guarantee of equal outcomes. Entrepreneurship is a key factor for wealth creation of a society. Therefore, entrepreneurs, both Chinese and foreign, will play an important role as the engine driving China's historical pursuit of common prosperity. If wealth doesn't grow, common prosperity will become a river without source or a tree without roots. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the theme of this meeting, cooperation in a fragmented world, is highly relevant. As President Xi Jinping noted, changes of our world of our times and of history are unfolding in front of us in an unprecedented way. The world has once again come at a historical crossroad, and its future depends on the choices we make. As for how to advance international cooperation, I'd like to share with you the following three observations. First, we need to uphold the right principles and maintain the effective international economic order. Under the new circumstances, the traditional way of thinking cannot provide a solution. Hence, we have to abandon the Cold War mentality, try to understand the essence of things from the perspective of material duality, endeavor to build a community with a shared future for mankind, and join hands to respond to global challenges. We believe that an equitable international economic order must be preserved by all of us. International division of labor, encouragement of competition, anti-monopoly, protection of property rights and IPRs, promoting entrepreneurship and free flow of production factors, fair distribution, ensuring macroeconomic stability and a strong social safety net are still economic principles that are relevant today. The government has a key role to play on major issues. Despite temporary resistance and some setbacks, we must have the courage to uphold truth and law of economics and address complex issues in a pragmatic way with plain and simple solutions. Second. We need to strengthen international macro policy coordination and strike a good balance between inflation and growth. To tame inflation, some countries have chosen the policy that will likely result in the hike recession recovery loop. But it is important to note that inflation this time around is driven by multiple factors, which is why it is complicated. Apart from the demand side, supply side measures are also needed to repair the supply chains and preserve energy and food security. A joint response to this challenge requires international cooperation and maintenance of peace. We call for more attention to the negative spillover effect of major countries' rate hikes on the emerging markets and developing countries so as not to add 
to more debt or financial risks. We also stand ready to work with all parties to find solutions to the debt issues of some developing countries. Third, we need a global response to climate change. Most countries in the world are keenly aware of the urgency of climate governance and the need for common actions. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed to us a possible connection between climate change and public health crisis. This is an area where effective international cooperation is needed. China will honor its commitments to the international community, push for global cooperation on climate change, work with other countries to tackle the serious challenges posed by it, how to strengthen cooperation in a fragmented world is a real problem we all face. We must face it squarely, dig deep into the causes of fragmentation, promote positive sum games, identify the possible converging areas of cooperation and explore the mechanisms for doing so. We must also work together to firmly safeguard world peace. We should be grateful that this year's Davos Forum presents us with an opportunity to do just that. I wish the Forum a full success and hopefully help us strengthen cooperation and preserve peace in a fragmented world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Premier. Um, we have time also for two questions. And I would like to follow up what you mentioned at the end and come back uh, to China's carbon not neutrality goal. Mm -hmm. um, China has announced its goal to be carbon neutral by 2060 and to make in such a way a strong contribution to the achievement of the Paris um, uh, objectives. Um, but what are the practical decisive steps that um, uh, must be taken? And uh, you mentioned already, what role does global collaboration play? Could you elaborate a little bit further, please? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Schwab, for your question. So may I answer in Chinese instead of English? Carbon peak before 2030 and carbon neutrality before 2060 are solemn commitments the Chinese government made to the world, and we will strive to achieve them. To achieve that, we are making efforts in a number of aspects. First, we are adjusting energy structure we will increase the share of renewable and new energy and enhance the efficiency of traditional energy, including carbon capture, storage. These are important. In the meantime, China's national reality dictates that we also need to promote safe and clean use of nuclear power. Second, we will focus on key areas of carbon reduction. 
有些行业呢，如果能抓住，我们将降低排放的百分之八十。If we can focus on these key areas, we are able to cut 80 percent of emissions, including power generation, construction materials, steel. We are also promoting the change of consumption behavior and make changes to the traditional manufacturing sector. Third, we think institutional arrangements are crucial. We have made a one plus N policy framework. We are promoting the building of carbon trade and green finance. On fiscal, on public investment, taxation, we will also make efforts in these aspects. Fourth, we must strengthen international cooperation. We are working with the United States, including under the United Nations, APAC, and G20 frameworks. We have established a series of mechanisms. We have already been working with the European Union in areas such as cities and industrial parks. We are working with the European Union on technology, and we are collaborating with emerging markets and developing countries. For instance, in Belt and Road Corporation, we have announced the end of building new coal-fire plants in international cooperation, and we will also provide financing to countries in need. I would also like to talk about Chinese modernization. Carbon neutrality is China's international obligation. This is also what China needs in driving its internal growth. It is not imposed on us. Rather, it is something that we want to do. The supply of primary products requires international exchanges. In China, we have a massive manufacturing industry. And in advancing industrialization and urbanization, China must make changes to our development model and promote green development. I've noticed that the idea of paradigm change in green development that was raised not long ago, the reduction of carbon emissions and carbon neutrality are crucial to China's survival. We're also taking a holistic approach to conserving mountain, water, forest, farmland, and grassland ecosystems. We know that lucid waters and lush mountains are invaluable assets. And we, are also need, we also need to promote green development among the public. Thank you. Vice Premier, in this context, we, we appreciate very much China's commitment to plant uh, in the framework also of our one trillion trees project to plant, uh, I think, 65 billion uh, trees in uh, the coming years. Yes, exactly. Now, I have a question which certainly Everybody is keenly interested, Vice Premier, because there have been so many uh, different reports about the COVID situation in China, mm -hmm. creating concerns uh, about uh, the health situation, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the impact on economic growth potential, um, and of course, the resilience and reliance on uh, supply chains. Mm -hmm. Could you enlighten us what the situation is and 
What can we expect of the final, if I may say so, normalization okay. of the situation? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, <clears throat> if I may, I still want to answer it in Chinese. Uh, as you mentioned, okay. As you mentioned, we are shifting our focus from dynamic zero COVID to the prevention of severe cases. It started on 8th December last year, and since 8th January this year, we have started to manage COVID as a class B infectious, dis infectious disease. That is a signal of reopening. First, the COVID situation is steady. China has passed the infection peak. Members of the society have returned to normal. There's a short span of time between infection peak and the returning to normal, which somehow is beyond our expectations. Second, living and production have been fully restored. Catering, tourism, and other consumption have restored has, have been restore, restored to normal. I have received quite surprising number from the transportation department. This year's Chinese Spring Festival will see some. 5 billion trips made, which is an enormous scale. That is why I said just now that life has been restored to normal in China. Third, the priority is still on the elderly, those with under underlying conditions, including diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. Now we are working to address these priorities. As things stand, hospitals, hospital beds, doctors, nurses, medicine, Supply of these factors can be ensured. Finally, for all of you, my foreign friends, you are most welcome to visit China. The policy we are taking right now is travelers only need 48-hour PCR test results upon entry. And there is no quarantine, no other additional requests. All of you, friends from the international community, are most welcome to visit China. We will provide you with the best services. On certain issues, we need a, some time for transition, but overall, there is no problem. I met a number of old friends yesterday. They told me that they want to visit China for the Boal Forum for Asia, for the high-level forum for development. That is also proof that things have been normalized. Thank you for your question, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Premier. We, um, highly appreciate that you came um, here to Davos actually just before the Spring Festival uh, starts. Uh, yes, exactly. You came here with uh, important delegation. Uh, thank you for sharing with us the latest uh, policies of the Chinese um, government of China. 
And uh, I think on behalf of all of us, I want to wish you a good year of the rabbit. Thank you very much. Thank you.